that you're here this morning. We're so thankful that you've taken this time, this first day of the week, to come together to do what we have been instructed as Christians to do and what we long to do on the first day of the week, and that is to worship God together, spend that time um, building each other up, and spend that time knowing that this day is set aside for our Lord. So, so thankful for you, so thankful for those who may be our guests this morning, those who may be visiting with family. We're thankful that you are here. We're honored that you are here with us. And we pray that you can come back any opportunity you may have and spend that time with us worshiping. I do want to take just a moment before we continue our worship service to make a few announcements. And then before we have our opening prayer, we'll make a mention of all those who are on our prayer list. I do want to read a card first. It says, thanks so much to everyone who helped make our drive-by shower so wonderful. We're so thankful for our loving church family and can't wait for Blaine to be part of it. Love, Sage and Ashlyn Harden. So we're so thankful for them. We can't wait. We're excited for the birth of Blaine as well. I do want to make mention, if you do feel a little overcrowded um, with, with the certain conditions that we're in uh, now, we do have some spillover areas out here in the ladies' classroom. If, if you need a little more space and make you a little more comfortable, do uh, be aware of that. Um, but you are welcome to stay where you're at. Just want to make sure that you are aware that that space is available. Uh, we do want you to be praying for the next steps that we are making uh, in our assembly and extending our assemblies back out to additional times. And beware of next Sunday, April 11th, as we will be meeting uh, Sunday evening at 5 p.m. And all that information is in the bulletin, so be sure to pick one of those up and you can see the, all those dates and times that have been added. We're so thankful for you. We're so thankful for the great time that we had yesterday, spending uh, that time fellowship, fellowshipping together at our Easter egg hunt. We're thankful for all the young folks and the parents who came and supported that. And we had around maybe 75 people, I believe, was the rough estimate of who was able to attend. Thank you for bringing snacks. Thank you for bringing the eggs to hunt. Thank you for bringing your children and being a part of that. We're thankful for Amanda and for Megan and for many others who spent time investing and planning that and preparing that together. So we're thankful for that we just are able to have that time together and be able to have those events again. So such a blessing. I do want to let you know that if you brought a dish on Friday morning um, as you were serving the Williams family, uh, that if you have a dish here, those are out in the fellowship hall, and you can pick those up uh, after service this morning. We mentioned in our class this morning, in our, in our teenage class, that today is a special day, and the world recognizes it, or at least our country recognizes it as a special day, first day of the week. It's Easter as we gather together, but we know as Christians that each and every first day of the week, each Sunday is a very special day. And so we're thankful to be here this morning to worship. We pray that you would put aside the cares of the world, the things that may be interrupting your heart or your mind to focus your time and energy on God today, that you can do that, that we can have a worship service that shows love and respect to him. And so we're thankful for that. And this time we'll turn over to Brother Rick. If you're able to stand, let's stand and sing this one. This is a one that's tough to sit and sing. Let's stand and sing. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem great all the whole day through, there's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friend, trust in his promises grand. Sing and be happy, press on to the goal, trust him who leads you, he will keep your soul. Let all be faithful, look to him and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Often we are troubled and tired, sick with sorrow and Be happy, friend. 
This morning's Bible reading comes from Colossians 1, 21 through 23. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, become a minister. Before Brother Keith Malinax leads us in our opening prayer this morning, we do want to mention all those who we want to, at this time, um, lift up to God in prayer as we go to prayer to, in prayer to Him together. We first want to extend our love to Haley and Crystal, Navy Williams and Riley Williams, upon the passing of Haley and Riley's mother. Sister Rhonda Williams, a uh, week before last. Um, her funeral was Thursday and her burial was Friday morning. We ask that you continue to be mindful of them in your prayers uh, in the coming days, weeks, and months. We're so thankful for Peyton Thomason and his request for prayers last Sunday. We're thankful for his willingness to be right with the Lord, and we're so thankful for him as a young man and the example that he is. Continue to pray for Peyton and his walk with God. We ask that you be mindful of Brother Roy Taylor, who's at home, for Sister Sandy Fike, who's recovering from her shoulder surgery, for Sherry Vance, who has some tests coming up this week, and we're praying for good results for her, for Sister Grace Gray, and we're thankful that she's here and from her the fall that she had, and we're so glad that she can be with us this morning. For Sister Pauline Engel, who has um, not been feeling well, and so continue to remember her. For Renee Hussein, who is recovering from kidney stones, be mindful of Renee, and, and for Arshad as well, who is... Um, undergoing some tests for his heart. Continue to pray for Sister Clary Suber, who is back home now with her grandson. She's doing better, and we ask you to continue to think of her as you pray together. Uh, we pray for uh, Alex Ernest as he's recovering from a leg injury. Be mindful of him. We're thankful that Sister uh, Sherry Schultz has been able to be with us and as she still recovers from her procedure. For Nelson as he is improving as well and recovering from his uh, surgery as well, be mindful of him. Need to be mindful of Brother Greg Wire's mother, Linda Johnson. She's been diagnosed with, with liver cancer and will be tre beginning treatment soon. So be mindful of Linda Johnson in your prayers. Also, the mother of Jonathan Appling, Barbara Appling, uh, who is going to have a, a very lengthy recovery. So be mindful of her and his father as well. For Rick's sister in law, Delia Wade, who's recovering from surgery. And for Brittany and Cameron's cousin, Amber Gilliland. Uh, she has uh, been had a very long battle with COVID, but has been recently moved to the uh, LTAC and rehab at Nolan and St. Vincent's East, and she is improving every day. And the family is thankful for your prayers. Amber is thankful for your prayers and your continued prayers for her. This time, let's go to God. Most wise, eternal Father, it's in you that we move, live, and have our being. We know that it is through thy Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to this world, gave his life, that we might have hope of eternal life, and that we would always worship you and praise you as a Christian should. Dear Heavenly Father, so many times in this life we make decisions in our life that are sometimes the wrong decisions, but we know that it is through your love in thy son and through his blood it washes us of our sins dear heavenly father at this time the leaders of this country who run this country we pray that they will look to you for guidance that this country may continue to be a free country and that we may be able to worship you in spirit and in truth with the freedom that we have had for a long time in our lives at this time dear heavenly father we ask you to be with those who have been mentioned this day of sickness any problems in their lives that they need help with be with the Williams family with the loss of their mom may they always look to you for their strength and the great memories that they had there while they were here with them 
So, Heavenly Father, we pray for this membership here at Parish. They will always continue to strive to become a stronger and better church that will be able to send the right things out into the world to know what it is to live a Christian life. Again, dear Heavenly Father, so many times we fall short of the glory. We pray that you always be willing to forgive us of our losses. But most of all, thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. For without him, we know we will not be nothing. Be with us this day as we worship you. May we worship you in spirit and in truth. May we do the things that makes you most happy and that you always will deserve. Be with us this day and on through future life. We pray that in the end, heaven might be our home. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. First and third verse of Tell Me the Story of Jesus. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious. Sweet is that Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest. Peace and good times. Then we come to the part of our worship where we partake of the Lord's Supper. If you will, if you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'll be reading verses 23 through 29. 1 Corinthians 12, 23 through 39. We as Christians, when we come together to worship on the first day of the week, Every week has a first day, and that's when we're commanded to come together and to worship thee. And at this time, let us read. For I have perceived of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, 
that the Lord Jesus, the same night in, when he, in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you to this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, this cup, he said, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink the cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body of the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that and of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to the judgment and to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. If you will now, let's take of the bread. Let us give thanks. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee again for this first day of the week, this opportunity we have to come together to worship thee. We thankful, Father, for this bread to which us as Christians represents thy son's body as he hang on the cross. Father, we ask that each one of us will examine ourselves and partake of it in a way and manner well-pleasing in thy sight. For it's in Christ's name that we ask. Amen. Let's give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee again for another day, for life and for all its many blessings. We thankful, Father, for this cup, the fruit of the vine, which to us as Christians represents thy blood, as he sh shed his blood hanging on the cross for the sins of the world. Father, we pray also that we will partake of this fruit of the vine in a way and manner well pleasing in thy sight. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. Let us give thanks for the offering, please. Holy Father, we thank thee for another day, for this first day of the week that we as Christians come together to worship thee. We pray, Father, for all the many blessings I so reach to bless us with, both spiritual and material. We pray, Father, that we will return them to thee. We've been prospered. We pray that we'll do it with a cheerful and liberal hearts. For it's in Christ's name that we ask. Amen. Than it. 
able to stand, let's stand and sing 552. I know who I have believed. After we sing this, we'll hear from Brother Joel. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed us for his own. But I know who I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him. Amen to the singing and to the opportunity to pray and to read and to commune at the Lord's table and also to share in our giving. We're thankful for every Sunday. We're thankful for this Sunday and know that we are thankful for this crowd, thankful for you and how you've contributed to our worship thus far. Colossians, the book of Colossians, the New Testament will be in chapter 2. We're going to begin in chapter 2, verse 4. In just a moment, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 4. Sometimes when tornadoes strike particularly rural areas, there's an interesting phenomenon that will happen and that they will find dead chickens and those chickens do not have feathers. They're bald chickens. For decades, the assumption was, well, the wind speeds are so fast it, it almost causes the feathers to just explode off of the chicken. Late 1800s, a man even tried to devise a test by which he could figure out the speed at which chickens lose their feathers in tornadoes. And that just became the accepted reason as to why this would happen from time to time. 1975, a man named Bernard Vonnegut wrote a little paper and he debunked that study, said it's not wind speed. There were even a few extreme kind of scientists who would try to say, well, this storm might have been this strong because it had chickens without their feathers. Well, this guy wrote a paper in 1975 that said, no, actually what's happening is the chickens are getting scared and they're doing what gets called flight malting or panic malting. They loose their feathers, loosen and lose their feathers when they are scared. Because they can't fly away when they sense a predator, a fox, a coyote, they'll release those feathers and hope that they can bite the feathers instead. So the better now prevailing theory is, is when you find a bald chicken after a tornado, it's not the wind, it's the fact that it got scared. And then, in the destruction and the winds, those, leave, those, excuse me, those feathers fell off. Weather is a scary thing, isn't it? I mean, we just go back a few weeks to the end of January. We've had several scares, several weather events that have impacted us. The end of January, that tornado hit Fultondale. Early February, we kind of put a day or two on hold because of winter weather. 
For two consecutive weeks, our area was under a high risk for severe weather for tornadic activity. And then last week, we had the third straight week of heavy rain, so we had local flooding that was pretty significant. So I'm, I'm guessing it's pretty clear there would be quite a bit of panicking over the past few weeks, months, because of the weather. Certainly a lot of energy has been invested, a lot of resources invested, a lot of attention drawn to the weather and our response. How are we to respond to general weather events or threatening weather events or even large-scale climate events? Well, quickly, just by way of inter introduction and illustration here, we can ignore weather altogether, in which case we suffer. We can completely devote ourselves to it and invest all of our anxious energy, our nerves over to it. We can panic because of it, in which case we'll still suffer. We can try in vain to control it. Now, we don't think about that one as much probably with local weather, but it's a billion-dollar industry, isn't it, to try to presume that we control weather or can fix weather, control the climate? But there is a sound, healthy response and that is to prepare, to check in on, to listen to briefly enough, long enough, so that we can know what to expect, use it as information, but then we get out and do what's most important for the day. We shift from actual weather to what we might think about as cultural climate, cultural thinking, culture being the shared values, the shared thinking, Thinking that influences action, which then influences thinking, which then keeps influencing action. So it's all of the strands of a society's people. Entertainment, journalism, and news, academics, spilling down into curriculum. Even government, legislation, and policy. All of those strands come together as culture. What would God have us to do to respond when it's clear those cultural influences are godless? Or at least in certain places, certain ways are at odds with his will. We respond to cultural climate in much the same way we would respond to actual weather. If we ignore it, we ignore it to our own peril. We will suffer. It will strike. Or we can panic because of it, in which case we will expend too much energy and it, it'll, it'll change and it'll leave us holding the bag, as it were, to leave us uh, vulnerable. We cannot panic because of culture, but neither can we try to control it and fight it. We must instead decide to prepare, and to prepare using the truth, the law that God makes available to us through his son. Over the next several months, we're going to keep coming back to, and even starting from the book of Colossians, using this, not necessarily this idea, but just knowing that the book of Colossians is a great place for us to start in terms of preparing ourselves with the truths that God has made available in such a way that keeps us prepared no matter what false cultural thinking is out there. There's something unique about the book of Colossians and its relationship to Paul, and that is that Paul had never been to the city of Colossae. He had never been a part of and with the church that met there. And yet... He could still write to them and explain the beauties of Christ in such a way that would prepare them for any false thinking they would be bombarded by. So even though Paul has not been to perish, has not been to the United States of America in 2021, this letter will help to prepare us, prepare our minds, to keep preparing us for a life and for lives and for the work of the church in such a way that helps us to defend against and be productive with the gospel. Listen to chapter 2, verse 4. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. They may sound good, but they might deceive you. For though I am absent in the body, yet I am with you in spirit. Even though there's a distance between us and Paul, even though he's never been. We can take this letter that he's written to a church he's never met and learn from its deep truths to help us in such a way that will prepare us to carry out the mission but also be protected, prepared 
in the midst of a challenging culture. So how does God? How does God want us to respond to a current cultural climate that has some issues, that has some conditions that are at odds with his very will? Well, notice three passages in our time together this morning. Let's start in chapter 2, specifically verse 8. Chapter 2, verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. So what we learn at the first level here is that in the midst of an unsatisfied culture, Christ gives fulfillment. You'll notice the dangers he enumerates in that verse number 8. It's philosophy. Every generation, every era, every location has its core philosophies. But when those philosophies are not rooted in God, they do not come from Christ, using the phrase according to Christ there at the end of his of verse 9. When they are not according to Christ, they take us captive. They bind us. They constrain us. And he says, beyond these philosophies that presume to be wise, they are full of empty deceit. They're deceitful. And they are according to, or excuse me, they are according to human tradition. They are according to the elemental spirits of the world. They're deceitful. Why? Because they seem to appeal to our most basic human tendencies in nature. They seem to be appealing because they're based on the human or the elemental, fundamental aspects of the world in which we live. So it's deceptive, very deceptive. And it will take us captive if we leave ourselves vulnerable. Do we see this spirit some 2,000 years removed? Of course. Of course we do. There's all sorts of, of doctrines and thinking that's promoted because it seems to go back to humanity and flesh and human nature. In our current culture, how often do we hear some very unnatural, very ungodly things that are held up and built up by words like science and data, nature, justice, fairness, love, identity, Elemental spirits of the world. You hear the echoes of that phrase? And yet, and yet those labels are really just a front, or they're really just a means to explain what often gets summarized now today as my truth. My truth. My truth has become the most protected thing, and I will do all I can do to protect my truth, and you must recognize and protect my truth. Just can't help but think of those statements. Human tradition, elementary spirits of the world. My truth, but propped up by the basic tenets of the world. Is that possible that we as Christians can be influenced and impacted by that kind of a cultural climate? Of course. We Christians are vulnerable we're vulnerable to thinking that says, whatever I experience, that's what goes. That I'll leave room for God, I'll leave room for Christ, but it needs to be on my terms. It needs to be what I prefer. It needs to be about me. Or maybe we run to those aspects of the world and we seek fulfillment in them. We Christians are still vulnerable to being tossed about. Paul would use that phrase, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, tossed about by every wind, every wave of doctrine. We can be tossed about by our desires to keep up, to fit in, and to stand out. That prevailing way of thinking in our culture can and will influence it if we are not prepared to defend against it. But notice in this text of Colossians 2, Christ is the solution. This thinking does not come from Christ but what does come from Christ? Verse 9, in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. God dwells fully in Christ. Therefore, what's possible? Verse 10, you have been filled in him. 
How did he describe the deceit in verse 8? By philosophy or empty deceit? When the world's philosophies and thinking enter our lives, they will inevitably leave us empty. We will keep going back to them because they never fulfill. But Paul says, when you live and think according to Christ, because he is completely filled by God, he is the fullness of God in bodily form, he now fills you completely. And Paul would close Philippians chapter 4. In verse 19, my God will supply, my God will fill, same verb. My God will fill, fulfill, will supply every need of yours according to his riches in Christ Jesus. So while we keep searching as a culture for things that constantly leave us empty and longing, we have the promise that Christ fulfills every need. But number two, look at verse 16 of chapter 2. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. Number two, in the midst of a culture that's given over to controlling nature, judgmental nature, Christ gives the realm for growth and maturity. You notice verse 16, the phrase is past judgment. Verse 18, the word is disqualified. Those are clearly parallel terms. But what's interesting is the verses themselves describe opposite ends of the spectrum. We would likely summarize verse 16 as those who pass judgment in a legalistic way. Things that are concerning the law. Far right, if you will. Verse 18, disqualify you based on the, the basis of progressive, mystical stuff. That's the other end of the spectrum. What that should remind us is that in any culture of any place... The temptation to reach down and to control and manipulate others with judgment, disqualification, it is not a respecter of persons. It's not a respecter of backgrounds. There are conservative and there are liberal people both who will give over to judgment and controlling natures. Now, do we see that in our culture today? Two words, two sets of two words. Cancel culture. Does that sound familiar? Right? There's, there's just prevailing thought right now. It's celebrated. It's honored. And if one person has one slip up from decades ago or, or maybe even recently, let's just cancel everything about them. Another phrase. It's more of an academic phrase, but the trickle-down effect has resulted in cancel culture. It's prominent in universities, it's prominent in that academic setting, and it's already trickling down even into public school curriculum. Critical theory. Maybe attached to race or gender or economics or sexuality. Critical theory. It used to be that critical was almost a good word. Let's look at what's good. Let's look at what's bad. Let's keep what's good and, and, and improve on or remove what's bad. But now when we hear that phrase, critical theory, attached to anything... It's essentially the same thing that would have been called several decades ago Marxism or communism. That anything that might have anything bad at all, let's just tear down the whole structure. That's what critical means now for many of these circles. A house has a single rotten board, let's tear down the whole house. A house has a single stone in its foundation that was a few centimeters off, let's just tear down the whole structure. That's a culturally celebrated value across this nation and around the world. Let's just tear it all down. Now, can this judgmental spirit, this cancel idea, disqualification, can that impact Christians? Are we Christians giving over to judgmentalism, trying to control? Absolutely. We can take truth, core truth, beautiful truth, and we can still use it as an excuse to mistreat others. Interestingly, at the end of this paragraph, verse 23, 
Paul says this asceticism is a form of self-made religion and that it does not possess. It has no value for stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Think about that for a minute. We are quickly drawn to trying to control and manipulate, and yet it comes from selfishness, and it does not actually control the flesh. It doesn't control us. It doesn't work. And yet we as Christians can buy into that thinking as quickly as anyone else can. We can also buy into the thinking when we refuse to extend forgiveness to others. Growth and maturity will not happen in an environment where forgiveness is not celebrated and honored and given to others. That's why in this paragraph we see Christ is the solution. Verse 18, they've cut themselves off with this disqualification, all this mysticism. They've cut themselves off from the head. The head is what nourishes. The head is what brings the whole body together. And then the closing phrase of verse 9 is it grows with the growth that comes from God. God-given growth doesn't come from control, manipulation, judgmentalism, or disqualification. It comes from the people of God submitting humbly to the grace of God, through the truth of God, and keeping on walking in Christ. He is the solution. You take a, a plant, and it's just as easy to overwater and kill that plant than it is to underwater that plant. Or put it in too much sun as it is to leave it in too much shade. We can overdo some things. And these false teachings around the culture in, Cor in uh, Colossae were guilty of that. And he warns them, don't become a victim to that kind of thinking. Instead, you be sure you're attached to Christ because it's Christ who gives the growth. Parallel passage of Ephesians chapter 4, when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Love is the arena in which God causes the church and causes us to grow. Number three, go back to chapter one as he discusses the Colossians directly and the journey they've taken. Chapter one, verse 21. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Number three, to a hopeless culture, in the midst of a hopeless culture, Christ gives transformation. You'll notice here, he's talking directly to them. They would have been Gentiles. He says, you were once, you used to be alienated, hostile, an enemy of God. And that led you to do evil deeds. We experience that. We see that in the culture around us. Have we experienced that ourselves? We understand what it means to be at odds with God. We alienate and cut ourselves off from God. That leads to further disappointment and hopelessness and anger and resentment. Which then leads us to even more evil deeds and sin, which creates the separation more and more. It's a cycle that continues. And we don't have to look long or far out into the culture around us to see that cycle continuing. And it's replayed that cycle so many times that the starting point for much of the prevailing voices right now is to not even start with God in the picture. To just have their backs turned completely to any semblance of truth that acknowledges God. And the form of outrage that's so often celebrated today, hostility in mind, he says, that outrage, outrage culture, is proof that this is against God. It's proof that their arguments are ineffective. If you have to get louder and louder and louder in order to get what you want, that in and of itself is proof you're not hanging on to truth. Truth doesn't need outrage in order to be effective. What about the church? What about we as Christians? Are we vulnerable to this kind of thinking? One way we're vulnerable to it is that we forget that we've gone through the same path of the Colossians. We forget that we were once alienated. We forget that we were hostile and enemy of God because of sin. We forget that we had sin in our lives. And that kind of arrogance, that pride, will not help us, and it's an affront to God in and of itself. It can also be hostile 
to God. And we can, um, we can also fall prey to this thinking when we adopt the same hopelessness of the culture around us. When we begin to listen to these voices so much that we begin to think, well, there's not really any hope. There's no hope for change. There's no hope for good. When we realize what God has done through Christ, you see it in the text, Colossians chapter 1. What's he done? He's reconciled. He's closed the gap, paid the debt. That's in the past, but that preserves something in the future. What's now possible because of what he has done for us in the future? We can stand at judgment in holiness in blamelessness and above reproach. He transforms those three things. He transforms alienated mind into a holy life. He transforms the hostile mind into blamelessness. He transforms evil deeds into being above reproach. What Christ has done for us in our past now preserves our future. As long as we continue to do what he says in verse 23, which is to remain stable, steadfast, not shifting. One of the hardest parts of a cultural climate is how often and how quickly it will shift. But when we remain faithful and keep going back to the truth that saved us, that's where we find true peace and stability that Christ offers. Transformation. Transformation now to a life that no one can imagine possible, but also transformation at glory. If we were creating the world, we never would have thought this. We never would have had the thought to begin with, but we certainly never would have had the ability to do it. That's to take that slimy, prickly, crawling caterpillar and turn it into a beautiful butterfly that can fly. We never would have thought to do it. And had we had the thought, we never would have had the power to do it. And yet God had the thought, and God shows us the power of transformation. The smallest of creatures that reflects the transformation he makes available in his son. To carry us from a sinful state to a state that now glorifies him. A transformed life, anticipating the ultimate final transformation for eternity at glory. So if we have these blessings, the blessing of fulfillment the blessing of maturity and growth, and the blessing of transformation. How do we access that in Christ? Same way the Colossians did. Go back to chapter 1. Chapter 1 and verse 5, you heard before in the word of the truth the gospel. Verse 6, you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. There's hearing, but there's hearing that results in understanding, believing what we hear. It's the gospel. It's the gospel of grace. It's the gospel of truth. And when we decide that we believe it, and we decide that we will do everything he asks of us, we understand that demands life change. You go to chapter 3, and he presents what that life change looks like. Chapter 3 opens by saying, if then you have been raised with Christ, he then says you put to death what is earthly within you. You put off the deeds of the flesh. Verse 9 you put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is renewed in the image of its creator. That's repentance. Complete life change. Well, he says, if then you have been raised with Christ. How would one know if he's been or she's been raised with Christ? Is there a moment we can point back to on a calendar that says, this is when I was raised with Christ? You go back to chapter 2. Verse 12, and he says, you have, you, you have been raised with Christ. When? When you were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith and the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. That's when. And every Sunday when we assemble as Christians, we honor and remember the death and the resurrection of our Savior. But so too, every time we assemble around a pool of water, a body of water, we witness and see someone dying to sin. We also witness the same power of the resurrection. That God raises that person in the same way he raised our Savior himself. Which makes transformation possible. And it also makes that future transformation and glory possible. Listen to the promise of chapter 3 and verse 4. When Christ who is your life appears you will also appear with him in glory. So the promises of fulfillment 
and maturity and transformation. Sweet and precious promises of God in Christ. But above all, that transformation and that reward and glory given to those who are in him. If that's the decision you need to make today, would you let today be the win? W-H-E-N? W-H-E-N? Let today be the win. Answer that question by responding to the gospel, being buried in the waters of baptism where he raises. If you need to come back to him, knowing you need forgiveness, you need to walk with him once again, let the blood of Christ cleanse you once again. by repenting and we'll pray with you and for you and walk with you and love you. Use this time to come as we sing together.